Hello viewers, welcome to Divine Stories. My name is Love Vester, and I narrate stories and near-death experiences of people who have died, gone in comma, and who have seen the other side. If you enjoy watching these videos, please consider giving us a thumbs up and hitting the subscription button and the bell icon to be notified of our new videos. Doing so is free and it does help us to grow. So thanks for your support. Welcome back viewers. In today's video, we will be sharing with you the continuation part of Brother Kalu Abosi testimony. This part you're about to watch is the part three of this testimony. We have shared the part one and two of this message. If you haven't watched the part one and two of this powerful testimony, I strongly recommend you to watch them before continuing with this part because the part one and two has the beginning and everything you have to know before getting on with the part three. A link in the comment section to the part one and two of this testimony. Thank you. With the temple I acquired, new responsibilities were given to me. Part of this included inviting seekers of power from the religious, political, social, and others from various walks of life to visit my temple. I was also given a pamphlet on laws guiding power usage. One of them is that a member of the kingdom of darkness is not to use his powers against another member unless one is erring. One day, one of my agents reported a religious gathering near my temple to me. I viewed the gathering through the occult screen in my temple and found it to be a church with all its members naked, except for one man who had a bright ring around his head. When a supernatural ring is seen around the head of an individual, signifying the presence of the Holy Spirit, it means he is born again. Some people's rings are dim while others are bright. From my findings, the man with a bright ring wasn't a member of that church. He only began attending because he couldn't find his own denomination as he recently relocated. I decided to finish him off. I monitored the gathering on a Sunday, and as the church service ended, I astral projected there. As the worshippers were coming out to the main road, including this Christian man, the Roman Catholic patrols were trying to control the traffic of car users. I noticed a man with a car coming from an opposite end as this Christian was about to cross the road, so I quickly took over the body of the driver and controlled his leg, shifting it from the brake to the accelerator, making the car go on full speed. I also made the car doors open so that even if the bonnet missed him, the car doors ajar won't. The car crushed many people, and I rejoiced in my temple. Later when I watched a playback of the scenario on my screen, I realized that the Christian man was actually spared. Not a single thing touched him. In fact, I learned that he later helped them clear the corpses. My joy quickly melted into disappointment, but I let it slide to focus on other duties. I then took the second egg from India and walked into a forest as instructed and chanted an incantation and smashed the egg on the ground. Immediately, there was a quake which split the ground open and I was taken down in it. I descended and appeared before a powerful demon who asked me who I was and what I was doing in his kingdom in an unfriendly tone. I introduced myself as a son of the Queen of the Coast on a mission to gain more wisdom and power and also told him of my predicament. The demon said there was really nothing spectacular to explore in his kingdom, but unlike during my first tour, I was free to ask questions which he would answer. I saw some earthly birds flying around and I asked the demon, what were they doing there? The demon told me that these birds were the ones responsible for helping them to plant supernatural trees, such as Tossy Tree, on earth. I also saw a deserted football field with many men and women chained to it. From the looks on their faces, they haven't eaten for months. I asked about this from the demon, and he told me that these were people whose souls were given to the devil in exchange for earthly riches as they wanted to alter their lives through material wealth, good health, or power. He said no matter how famished they look, they won't die. He explained to me that pacts are made with the kingdom to give human lives in exchange for power. He mentioned the name of a certain prophet in Amaogudu, whose name I had forgotten, who made a covenant with him that he would regularly supply two human heads for his power to manifest in his church. The transaction went smoothly for years until the past few years when his debt accrued. 
After warnings, this demon and his army stormed into his church in fury, demanding their dues, causing serious erosion to occur on the road leading to his religious structure. To the physical realm, the erosion was presumed to be caused by a massive flood, leading to much public complaint. The man managed to appease the demon, but he admitted he will still end his life when he is tired of his game. I inquired how the erosion they supernaturally caused would be repaired. The demon said they have their own recognized construction company that will take up the task. The demon also showed me on a large screen pictures of many wealthy people, scientists, philosophers, and elites. The demon told me that some of these people were dead while the others were still alive, but all of them have been in partnership with the realms of darkness. Some of these people I said I knew and were still alive as of the time of my writing. The demon said, if any of these people should violate any of the laws guiding the kingdom of darkness, they will be subjected to the irrevocable penalty of death. After spending three days with that demon, I realized that what he said about their own construction company repairing the damaged road was indeed true. The queen arranged for me to embark on a tour to all the 14 kingdoms of darkness in order, order to incorporate all the wisdom and power needed in my operations. This journey took an entire month, and after the visits, I was equipped with more power and knowledge. There were 17 occultists of equal rank to me worldwide, but I happened to be the youngest and the most aggressive. The notice reached me that a massive crusade was to be held in Abariba, my own base, tagged the Greater Abariba for Christ 1989. This was to be my assignment. I first went out in my spirit body to one of my agents, a market woman. I appeared to her in the shop and instructed her to mobilize other agents to be present at the crusade venue. I then drew up an agenda for a meeting with Satan and the Queen of the Coast on this matter. When Satan appeared at the meeting with the Queen, he asked what my agenda was about, and I read it out without hesitation, how to thwart the greater Abariba for Christ crusade. As I mentioned the word Christ, we all could hear peals of thunder, a roar of fire, and an invisible power forced the three of us to bow our heads to the ground for about 30 minutes. When we got up from the ground, Satan warned me furiously to never use that name again in his presence ever again. Satan began to boast that he had captured the town of Abariba for as long as her existence. I asked him which weapons he utilized and Satan said they were pride, hatred, love of money, and cultural activities. Hence, that upcoming crusade was an affront that must be resisted. He ordered me to mobilize all the agents under me into action and frustrate the crusade. After boasting some more, Satan eventually disappeared. When he was gone, the queen walked up to me, but we were suddenly panicking as the whole place began to quake. At her command, our screen showed where the rumblings were coming from. A Christian man was preaching the gospel around Ameki Square. Apparently, whenever the gospel of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed in the physical world, it causes ripples in the realm of darkness. The queen chanted an incantation, and a bottle appeared in her hand. She rubbed its gummy-slash-sticky contents on my face and commanded me to go after that preacher and stare at him face to face with that concoction, and the demons would melt the preacher into natural water. I woke up physically and left the house immediately. My family knew I had a habit of visiting the restroom every morning, so though they didn't think it was unusual for me to go out at that time. After walking hurriedly, I located the preacher from a distance, but as I was about to catch up with him, suddenly two angels appeared and were walking towards me. It soon got to a point that the angels were close to me and wouldn't allow me to go any further. I chanted an incantation against them. It didn't work. I had been given a special ring when I visited Satan's kingdom. The ring is called the Good, the Bad, the Destroyer. Satan told me that the demons attached to the ring would make a bad situation become good, turn a good thing into bad, and would also destroy a bad thing slash person. I used this ring against the angels as I had been instructed, but it didn't phase them. I couldn't even stand in their presence as their countenance was like the sun in its zenith, so I began to stagger like a drunk. The two angels captured me and took me to a place in the woods where they tied me to a tree by bright white cords they produced from their bodies. 
They then left their two swords by each of my ears and left the place. The sword began to sing in the most melodious voice I had ever heard and later began to preach the gospel to me. Though I found the message somewhat tormenting, each time the name of Jesus was mentioned, I would feel burns on my body. One line from the messages stuck with me. I will make you fishers of men if you will follow me. Later, the angels returned, picked up their swords without saying a word to me, and untied me. By then, the day had dawned. I chanted an incantation to disappear, but it didn't work. I repeated it, still didn't work. I then recalled when I visited Satan's kingdom, they taught me that whenever I got defeated, I should walk two poles away from the site and repeat the incantation. I did that and I was taken to my room and being fatigued, I slept off on the bed while my spirit traveled to my temple. When my mother returned from the market and found me lying on the bed, she got the shock of her life. She wanted to know how I entered the room. I managed to mumble some excuse about the padlock not being properly locked, but my mother knew that was impossible. This padlock was brought by my brother from Cotonou and wouldn't lock unless the key was removed from it. I couldn't seem to convince my mother of my fib, and that raised her suspicion. She confided in one of her friends who suggested they visit a witch doctor. Even though my mother wasn't a Christian, she didn't like anything involving consulting a fetish priest. But her friend urged her to go find out the spiritual identity of her son. They visited a rather popular Dibia whose name I declined from revealing. He gave them a stick with which they were to touch the body of the person whose spiritual identity they wanted to know. This, my mother, did that night at about 2 a.m. I was watching this with my spiritual eyes. Dibia are the mystic mediators between the human world and the spirit world and act as healers, scribes, teachers, diviners, and advisors of people in the community. They are usually consulted at the shrine of a community major deity. When they took the stick back to the Dibia, he asked for the name of the person they were inquiring about, and the moment my name was mentioned, there was pandemonium in the shrine. All his deities began to wail loudly in his ears, and when they stopped, the heads of their images began to break to the ground. His powers began to crumble. The Dibia began to act insane, yanked off the wrapper from each of the women, luckily they wore two, demanded their money and sent them away, bewildered. After this incident, I invoked Satan to my temple and consulted him with incantations. He was pleased. He charged me to fight like a soldier and deploy all the powers at my disposal in my assignment. On the first day of the crusade, I had deployed more than 100 of my agents to infiltrate the crusade ground. Some were assigned to sell a cocktail of rum or gin in small nylons, while others were to distract listeners by engaging them in mundane discussions. These were being monitored on the screen from the spirit realm. As crowds began streaming in, I gave them their signals and these agents commenced their assignments. Many of the attendees who bought the drink became tipsy and fell deeply asleep, but some spat it out, received the gospel, and became saved. On one of the days, a preacher mounted the crusade podium and began to pray. From the screen I was viewing, this preacher was surrounded with flames of fire, and as he preached on, some of my agents fell by the power of God. At the end of it, many of the agents were also converted. The others returned to give me to give their report. The next day, I mobilized more agents to the ground and instructed them to bring back their reports. But most of them didn't return as they were arrested by the power of God and became converted. At this point, I decided to launch attacks against the organizers of the crusade. I invoked the wind, rain, and storms to destroy their billboards, posters, and damage their items of equipment. That worked, or so it seemed. By the third day, it was obvious that the more agents I sent to the crusade ground, the more our loss and the greater our defeat was becoming obvious. One afternoon, while the crusade was ongoing, a helicopter hired by the crusade team was distributing flyers of the program and my window was opened. The wind made many of the flyers stream into my room. I picked up a copy and saw Greater Abariba 4. With fury, I clutched at the papers, tore them, squeezed them, and threw them out through my window. Not only have I sent my agents to this crusade at my own expense, they even had the effrontery to bring their flyers into my own room. Later, I shut my window and reached for the last egg from India, 
and after chanting the words required, I angrily smashed it on the floor. The chief demigod appeared. This time, I cared little about protocols and began venting in rage, shouting at the chief to behold the defeat and shame that have befallen the kingdom. I have already lost many agents in this war. I have done all I knew, yet there was no victory in sight. The chief sounded rather conciliatory, appealing to me to exercise understanding that they too were trying their best, but there's nothing much they could do at that point. I proceeded to invoke Satan to address him. When he appeared, I complained to him also about what was going on. Satan arrogantly stated that he would have the victory. He commanded me to go to the crusade myself and make use of all the powers I had been given to thwart the crusade. Then he disappeared. As the chief demigod was speaking on, there was a roaring voice like that of thunder from above, and he instantly disappeared too. At that moment, I felt a great presence in my room. The room was dark, but a white big hand emanating a glow of light appeared and began to write things in gold letters on the wall of my room. I was so engulfed in fear unable to even move my mouth as I felt totally subdued by the power in the room. A searing heat engulfed me, making my heart thud so loudly that I could feel it in my mouth. The hand wrote with the index finger, Will you surrender to me, yes or no? I couldn't answer, but in my heart of hearts I affirmed yes. Then the hand wiped it off and wrote another, Whether you like it or not, you will surrender and you will become a fisher of men. Then it wrote, Write your surrender letter before you go to my crusade. With that, I picked up a pen and paper and wrote my surrender letter. I could no longer control myself and was completely unable to resist the power of God, which arrested me. I went to the crusade ground the next day, after enduring what seemed like a searing heat, like someone made to stand while the whole of Abba town was engulfed in flames. When I got to the place, I sat at the far back and dispersed my spirit man into different places which made the internal heat subside a bit. I quickly realized I wouldn't be able to operate there. I paid little attention to whatever was going on, but from where I was I could see with my occult eyes that Satan was right when he said he had captured Abariba town because about 90% of the people at the crusade ground was stark naked before the powers of darkness. The preacher that night was Rev. Uma Ukpai, but I couldn't remember the title of his sermon. I clearly avoided looking in his direction because his face was radiant with the glory of God, just like those of the angels I encountered before. At the end of the sermon, he invited those who wanted to give their lives to Jesus Christ to come forward, and he began to pray. As he mentioned the name of Jesus, I saw myself levitate several feet into the air and land back on the ground. The policemen and some people seated around me quickly fled. At that point, I became physically unconscious but spiritually active as I tried to project my demons into the others who fell with me. I was carried to the podium where the ministers began to pray for me. When I came out of consciousness, I reached into my pocket and gave one of the ministers my letter of surrender. The man asked me, Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? I asked, Who is Jesus Christ? As I said that, one of the occult rings Satan gave me, the good, the bad, the destroyer, knocked me unconscious again, apparently to prevent me from affirming Jesus as Lord. The pastors came together and began to pray for me as various demons began to manifest through me. I was said to pull out weeds from the grounds with my teeth and nails, slithering on the ground like a snake, squirming and screaming. When I came to, Many of the visible and invisible rings on my toes and fingers had vanished. Some of them had peeled out my toenails while leaving. The ministers further prayed for me, and the light of God entered my heart. I took them to my place and surrendered all my paraphernalia and occult tools for burning, but two items refused to be burnt. The transcendental flying saucer, which demons utilized in supplying my applicants with power, and the ring Satan gave me, the good, the bad, the destroyer. I was so exhausted that I fell deeply asleep but woke up later in the night to realize someone sleeping next to me. It was the queen. I was facing the wall while she was facing the other direction. She began to speak that she knew I have left them, but she's ready to welcome me back if I choose to return. I struggled to remember the name of Jesus. It wasn't a name I was familiar with, but I knew its power. If only I knew, 
I could have asked any of the ministers to write it on the wall for me. Suddenly I remembered it, and even before I called it out, the queen herself experienced a form of fire and quickly vanished. I went back to sleep and was taken up to heaven accompanied by a friendly angel to see its beauty. The streets were more beautiful than the ones I had seen in the kingdom of darkness and their structures were superior. This, I was made to understand, was what God has prepared for those who serve Him. After my salvation and deliverance, I sought to live a normal life again. I visited a man who used to owe me some money, and when I narrated my newfound faith to him, the man admitted he became suspicious I was involved in the occult due to some strange dreams he began having after he held on to my money. I was paid back the money and I moved to another town. While I was there I visited a friend who informed me that all the possessions I kept at his place had mysteriously disappeared from the room. I assured him not to worry since I knew full well who had taken it. I wanted to start a business and began to make some contacts. One of the contacts promised to take me to his boss who would help me procure the resources I needed. Then I followed the man and after hours of journey finally led me to an uncompleted building in the outskirts of town. As if I knew what was going on, I wasn't surprised to see Satan, the Queen, and two agents carrying the luggage that my friend had declared missing waiting for me there. The Queen told me they had lots of goodies for me. They would give me more wealth and power and whatever I asked for, only if I'd sign on their register of agreement. They handed me the register and I realized my name was no longer in it. They also gave me a blood-soaked pen to sign in the agreement. When I saw the blood in the pen, I simply declared the blood of Jesus. At the mention of that, they all vanished, leaving me stranded at the place too, as the money I earlier put in my pocket had also vanished with the specters. I met a man who was traveling to Afikpo in Ibani State to buy fish by canoe, and he decided to help me. An elderly man he was carrying and didn't know suddenly paid my fare, and I blurted out that I didn't want his assistance. I had just been robbed and wanted to get by safely. When the man saw that I didn't yield to his ploy, he quickly put the money back in his pocket. Later that night, I was arrested by the police for sleeping at an unauthorized place and put in jail because they thought I was a thief. In the jail, one of the inmates walked up to me, introducing himself as the boss, and asked me for money. When I told him I had none, he dealt me a painful blow and left me. That night, I had a dream in which an angel of God encouraged me not to be discouraged by my experience, as God already planned that I would through that place become a fisher of men. I was told that God has called me to preach the gospel and narrate my testimony, pointing to the love of God and His readiness to save no matter the depth of one's sins. When I woke up in the morning, I was really encouraged, and after a day, I was set free and found my way back to my place and became established.